Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, I get to do an amazing interview with one of the people that I follow pretty much everywhere on Twitter. And then also just got on her uh, Patreon account, even though I probably just mispronounced that, even though we talked about it in the pre-show. And I apologize. Andrea, how are you doing? Thank you so much for uh, joining us and letting me interview you. I'm good. I'm so excited to be here. Thanks for having me on. Oh, we, I mean, we, um, let me just talk about myself. I, I am so excited to have you here because I, there's a lot of different pieces uh, that go to your Twitter that I think is just great. First off, you know, your scouting's great. I, I love the kind of deep dives you did. And, and I'll, I'll pull up, uh, I'm going to just pull up the the Twitter right now here. And this, the deep dive you did on Aaron Saval was fantastic. I had actually his brother, Nick, um, on an interview pre-season and we because he is a physical therapist uh, licensed and he uh, was talking about kind of helping fantasy players look at different injuries and which ones they should be worried about so having when aaron was called up and uh called out on on your twitter feed and you really did this amazing breakdown in fact you do it all the time i was just addicted and that's why i reached out to you and i said hey you know what if you could come on for an interview that would be amazing Thank you so much. Yeah, he was a really cool one to look at. And I, through that process, found out that we went to the same college at the same time. But I don't wow. think we ever crossed paths. <laughs> but yeah, he's uh, been great for the race so far. So I'm excited to see what he continues to do with them and, and into next year as well. So looking at all the different things, first off, you know, like I said, your Twitter account's amazing. But just looking at just a, just some of your you know accolades that you've done, I mean, you've obviously have this great Twitter, but you've also worked for the Yankees. Can you just tell me and give just a brief, you know, look at, well, I don't know how brief you can go with all of the things you've accomplished, but for those that don't know you, can you just give a kind of a quick look at your background? Sure. So, um, I guess this story started when I was in college. I uh, did a six month internship with the Tampa Bay Rays and their strategy and development group. And that was my first real exposure to what it was like to work in an MLB front office. And I fell in love with it, of course. Uh, but at the time, I was studying civil engineering. So I went on and I became a civil engineer after I graduated. And then I started my blog, Scalco Report, as a hobby uh, just to like, you know, see what I could do and, and try to make some, make some friends in the baseball community because I really didn't know anyone there. And I started making videos because that really seemed like how everything was trending and I had a lot to say. So I thought it would be easier to, to do it in a video. Uh, and one of them, one of my first ones, Ryan Yarbrough's arbitration trial uh, was the topic. And I think that that video kind of provided a perspective that not a lot of fans see uh, for how our, the arbitration process actually works and why some of our favorite players lose their cases. So that got me um, a decent amount of followers some more exposure. And then from there, I started teaching myself more about like stats and analytics and all that stuff. I started hearing from different teams that were reaching out. And one of those teams was the Yankees. So they told me about this position that they have in their baseball ops group, uh, the baseball ops associate. And I worked there for the 2022 season, January to January. And now I'm just uh, mostly doing my blog now, doing uh, a monthly column at The Athletic. And I do have a Patreon uh, where I post some like exclusive content. We do some guest interviews and things like that. I'm a member of it. Uh, and I am absolutely uh, just astonished that you have as much time as you do <laughs> to, you know, live, live a life, provide the content you have on both, you know, your Patreon and Twitter and well, everywhere else. So we're really excited to keep following you. I'm also an athletic uh, uh, subscriber as well. So, sorry, I, I, I keep pushing this stuff, but I just want to let everybody know that these are some great places to spend your money uh, as well. So, all right. Um, well, that's awesome. Uh, I am incredibly jealous uh, because of your stellar talent, uh, because I am constantly trying to scout people for the fantasy baseball community. And that's really kind of the, the lens we need to look at some of this for. But before we do that, again, I want to kind of delve a little deeper into, you know, your career. And who is the first player you scouted? I, the Yarborough uh, breakdown of the arbitration was fantastic. It's one of the th first ones I really looked at and was just blown away because I always knew players came away from those arbitrations really kind of with a chip on their shoulders because of mm -hmm. so much that is being called out there. 
And, you know, it's, it's almost like, let me tell you all the reasons why this player is terrible, but we still want to keep them. <laughs> and when you broke that down, it just was, it was really amazing to me. But I would love to know before that, who's the first player you really scouted, even on paper or for Twitter? Um, hmm. So this is a tough question because I feel like since I worked at the Rays, I was going to go out of their home games and I would just like naturally take notes at the games because I was sitting by myself. <laughs> so to like, you know, if I was started noticing interesting things, I would just take notes and then like go back and see if there was anything to it. So I think it just kind of happened naturally from there. I think my first ever video on Twitter or any social media was about Mike Zanino in 2020. Uh, cause I wasn't sure. I thought that he might be able to like turn it around and, and have a decent season, but I kind of wanted to dive into why he might've had a slow start with the Rays at the time. Uh, and then in terms of like an actual first scouting report, I think the first one I wrote was about Dominic Hamill. He's, he's a Mets prospect. I wrote that last year when I went to a minor league game. And then uh, with the Yankees, they let me uh, write some scouting reports on some players that would come to visit. So I wow. think of the bigger names, I wrote one on Luis Castillo, Frankie Montes, like in advance of the trade deadline. Right. Uh, so, yeah. So what's the difference, if any, uh, from a, and of course, I don't want you to break out in confidential information, but what's kind of the difference between what you kind of give us in a scouting report and, you know, the public versus what MLB teams are looking for, other than, of course, the grades um, that they probably are asking you to do. But is there anything in particular that, you know, they're asking for that you wouldn't see on kind of an amateur scouting report? Um, by amateur, you mean like the stuff that I put on social media? Well, yeah, or I'm do sorry. You mean, like, I, I, and I didn't, I didn't mean derogatory, of course. I mean, your stuff is oh, professional. No, no, no. I, wasn't, <laughs> yeah. I wasn't sure if you meant like amateur players, like high school oh. players. <laughs> no, I understood. I understood. I was like, I was like, oh, no, no. I hope she doesn't think. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I meant like, uh, yeah, non, non MLB, uh, like, in, you know, in office, like what you'd actually, you know, okay. hand over to the desk. My apologies. <laughs> No, no worries. Uh, I just wanted to make sure I understood the question. Okay. No, so, sure, sure. Um, the stuff that I put like on my blog, I try to like story tell and I uh -huh. try to break it down. So like anyone can understand it. You don't need to know about like all these, these advanced stats and, and anything. And in general, I think it's more of like a, you know, paragraph format, like things like that. Like you said, I don't put grades um, though I maybe should, but a traditional uh, <laughs> scouting report that you would hand in at a team is more so like you're grading each of the player's skills. So like for a hitter, that would be like the five tools. Or um, for a pitcher, that would be like uh, you'd grade each one of their pitches, their control, uh, that kind of stuff with a number. And then you'd give an overall number for like the present value at the major league level and the future value mm -hmm. um, based on like anything that you think they can improve. And then uh, you'd include like a summary, a few sentences about like, what you think about them, what they're going to be, and then just like some of the things that you noticed about them. Okay. Wow. So it's a and different it, format. Oh yeah, for sure. I um I, I love the fact that they're actually asking for future value there. That's that's great. Uh, you know, I, I know it's not a civil engineering uh, terminology, but that's that's still awesome to see the future value there. That's <laughs> awesome. oh, by the way, my my mom uh, got her master's in civil engineering, so I thought that was cool. I, I, I had no idea about oh, that. Oh, very, very big. Yeah. Um, yeah. All right. So. Top three, top four, top six. I just picked three because it's easy. But who are your favorite players right now? And not just from a scouting perspective, right? Just, you know, top favorite players. Okay, I tried to get a little creative with this, so I'm not going to say anyone, like, super popular. Um, but okay. the first one that I wanted to highlight was Tristan Beck on the Ooh. Giants. Okay. Um, and he... I haven't gotten a chance. I've been busy the past couple of weeks, but I've been dying to look into him because he pitched on Sunday night baseball against the Braves, I think a few weeks ago. And he just looked really good. Like he, I was really impressed by his stuff. I think through three starts now, his ERA is like 4.04 .04 I have, mm -hmm. but I think there's more to him than that. Uh, especially like looking into next year, since this is like his first debut season. Uh, his fastball gets a little more ride than average. He like tinkers with this slider. So he's got like one gyro slider, one sweeping slider, and then he's got this curveball as well. And they all have like really good movement. 
And that game, I know it's only one game, but that game that he pitched yeah. against the Braves, he was like really fooling their hitters and his stuff was like really sharp and and looking really good. So I think he's like a really interesting uh, pitcher to watch right now, at least. Oh, I am so thankful you got creative with this because, you know, last thing I'd be like, oh yeah, you know, uh, oh, uh, let me pick the top, uh, you know, Freddie Freeman. I'm like, oh. Really? Okay. Yeah. All right. so, I do like Freddie Freeman. <laughs> oh, well, I mean, of course you do. But yeah. uh, well, I mean, people that don't like the Braves, obviously, yeah. I mean, uh, or the Dodgers, right? But at the same time, yeah, yeah. You should, uh, everybody should. Uh, all right. Give me somebody else. All right. Uh, next, I have Robert Stevenson on the Rays. Ooh, He's a early okay. pitcher. Right. And uh, they acquired him. He joined the team in like early June. And since then, he's had the third best strikeout rate among qualified relievers in baseball. And it's because of this like hard slider or cutter. I think he refers to it as a slider. So that's what I'm going to call it. Uh, He's got a hard slider that's like an insanely good pitch. Uh, It's got a 218 X slug, which is elite and a 59% whiff rate, um, which is also incredible. Um, So they like up the usage. They made it him throw that a little harder and the movement is just so good. It's been getting great results. So he is a reliever. I wanted to highlight. It feels like any pitcher that goes there just like gets like a bump uh, from them. If they have, you know, something that can be worked on. Absolutely. You know, with uh, Stevenson in particular, I remember, especially in dynasty leagues, when he was coming up with the reds, I was really focused on him because I was like, you know, he looked like a great starting pitcher had a lot of the pedigree and he just didn't seem like he could put it together, especially for that second mostly the third time through the rotation. So seeing the Rays, you know, well, first I've seen him go to a relief pitcher and then seeing the Rays get to tinker with him, like the Rays always seem to do and find the right person. It just made like a perfect match there. And you're absolutely right. He just seems unhittable sometimes. And I, especially in these short spurts. So I, I love that you highlighted him. And do you have a third? Yes, I do. It's another Ray uh, okay. hitter this time, Yandi okay. Diaz, who I know he has been getting some more recognition this year, but I still don't think it's enough. I feel like him in particular, he was like a ticking time bomb for when is he actually going to figure it out and start like hitting consistently. And this year was it. He's always had like elite contact quality. He's got a 53% hard hit rate. And in addition to that, he walks and he doesn't really strike out that much. So it's like a beautiful, like three skilled combination. Right. And like I said, he has been getting some more well-deserved attention this year, but still not enough. He He's ranking really highly in all the, the leaderboards. You'd, you'd think that he'd get a little more. So uh, let's have a fourth player. Um, do you have a fourth player? It's fine if you don't. I just wanted to ask before I move to the next question. I do not. I, I stuck okay. to three. <laughs> no problem. It's all fine. I just wasn't sure if you're going to have a problem uh, picking three. Uh, you know, if you could pick a position right now that you'd want to have at an MLB team, what would it be? Because it's, I mean, scouting, of course, is kind of a big, huge salad bar type thing now. I mean, is there a particular particular area, you know, that you'd want in player development or something like that? Or is there another place that you'd want to be in an M- with an MLB uh, organization? To work or to play? Like if I was a, a player Ooh, or if I was I, actually... You know what? I, I was saying to work, but if you if you okay. want to say to play, uh, if you want to... Either one works for me. I mean, or both. Okay, I'll, <laughs> answer, I'll answer both. Um, I would... My dream would be to be a pitcher. I think that would be so cool. Like an amazing starting pitcher, not like, you know, someone who just pitches every so often. Like I want (laughs) to be, you know, up there with, with DeGrom and Cole and Otani and all of them. All right. And then uh, in terms of like reality, (laughs) I guess um, I, it, it depends. Like I'm very happy with what I'm doing right now. And uh, if something interesting opened up with a team, I'd be open to it, but I'm not, like actively pursuing that at the moment. I'm just going to let whatever happens happen because up until this point, that's worked very well for me. So keeping an open mind. Okay. Well, hold on. Going back to the fantasy of you pitching. um, Are we talking, are you a, (laughs) are you a power pitcher or are you like a, you know, nibble, you know, like a control pitcher, you know, Maddox style Glavin type, you know, or are you like straight, like, like you said, the, the, the three pitches you picked are, you know, hundred plus and, you know, crazy power, but just want to, just want to make sure we all understand, you know, what, what pitcher we're uh, okay. dealing with here. <laughs> okay. Yes. I am a strikeout pitcher, but okay. I also get ground balls. So nothing is okay. ever going in the air. 
All right. And uh, <laughs> let's see. Yep. I'm exclusively over 96, 97 on a consistent right. basis and just absolutely dominant. That's what I'm going right. for. Yeah. <laughs> so you, so you, have, you have a big cutter, obviously, then, right? Is that what we're talking about? Uh, you know what? I, I love the fact that this has gone completely off the rails yeah. here and we can just talk. <laughs> so sorry, but I like I, I warned you ahead of time. You know, I was going to I was going to find something fun to talk about. So. All right. Uh, so going back to what we did talk about, we're going to talk about. Um, so do you think there's a player who is like w- one adjustment away from going to the next level? And that could be on both sides of the ball, right? Pitcher um, or hitter. Um, and, and again, minors, majors, I don't really care. But, you know, again, we're looking at players that people that are going to watch this are in Dynasty, especially, right? And I'm going to always try to find a place to buy low and look incredibly smart. But most of them, most of us aren't very smart. So we're going to lean on you, who is very smart, to let us know somebody that's maybe that that one change away or going to the Rays uh, away from being an amazing player. All right, Andrea was called away quickly for an emergency scouting report. She's back now. And uh, she, I think it was a very hard-hitting question. I apologize. That was my fault. Uh, but yes, we're, we're, so which player do you think is one adjustment away? That's dying to know. So this is always a this is always a tough question because it's so hard to make adjustments. But I picked Spencer Steer on the Reds. Ooh, okay. And I I know he's been doing well this year, but if you look at like some of his advanced stuff, like his actual slug is 451, but his X slug, so expected based on his like contact quality and all that, is only 407. Which is not that great. Not as great as 451, obviously. Right. Um, but like that difference, that gap in the stats indicates to me that maybe he's like gotten a better result than he should have on a few of those balls that he hit. But regardless, like my point here is that I think that he can achieve 451 for expected for reality and higher because I think that there's more in the tank for him power wise and. In terms of like what that adjustment would be, I think that when he is actually at bat, he could better utilize his lower half to like bring in some of that power a little more. Because right now he has like this big leg kick, but sometimes it's like inconsistent the way that I've seen it. Like a lot of the times it looks like he's not actually using it. Like it's not doing anything mechanically for him okay. except like maybe something related to timing. But I do think that there's a lot going on there and it could affect his timing in either a negative way, which it hasn't yet. Um, or like, he's not really leaning on like his entire lower half of his body to like generate more consistent hard hits. So I think that he can do that. Um, if just a few minor adjustments can get him there. Well, you know, I love the fact that he picks Spencer steer, uh, who is somebody that we picked up, um, on our waiver wire show earlier. And the f- I just love how exciting Cincinnati has become. Now, from a pitcher's perspective, I avoid Cincinnati's home park like the plague. It's become worse than Colorado. But from a hitter's perspective, I mean, the fun that they have there, right? Ellie De La Cruz, I'm mean, just all the hitters there, um, you know, Marte, everybody. It just seems like they're just having so much fun out there. And, and that seems to really be bubbling out. So having you pick Steer is just great especially considering that you know we're, we liked him on a previous show and i just hope it continues that improvement so that that's awesome um so i would love to know <laughs> who's harder to scout pitchers or hitters what i'm sure this is like a personal preference but yep. i think that they're both tough in different ways so like okay. for hitters i think they're challenging because like like let's say we're just talking about like in-person scouting and looks like Mm -hmm. you need to see them for like several days because you're only going to see them for like three at bats and they might, they might not even swing for one of the at bats. You know, you never know (laughs) that that happened to me a few times last year where I was trying to look at certain players and it's like, well, I never even got to see him swing one time or he only (laughs) swings once in the at bat and someone is walking in front of you. So (laughs) it's (laughs) like that could be challenging. I didn't even think think about that. (laughs) Yeah, <laughs> that, that unfortunately happened a few times. Uh, but, you know, so you need to see them like a few days in a row, whereas for pitchers, like at least you can start to get a feel if they're a starter for like what they have. Because um, if let's say they throw a slider, you know, 20 times in a game and one of them looks really good, you at least know like, OK, like they have the potential there. Like it could if they could do that consistently, like that's kind of how he gets to the future value. So I think that 
pictures are easier in the sense that you don't necessarily need to see them like three days in a row, but they're also harder because you need to think about way more. Um, you need to think about like pitch sequencing, like how are they on the mound? How are they when things get out of control, which you don't always see in one start? Um, and then how does the hitter react to them? How are their mechanics? Like there's a lot going on um, for both, but I would say pitchers are, are a little harder, especially when you don't know what they throw and you're kind of just like thrown in and you're trying to figure out like, <laughs> oh, wait, that wasn't his slider. Right. Like he also has a curveball. Like there's a lot of different <laughs> right. you know things going sure. on. <laughs> um, so that, that leads me to ask you a question. Uh, so when I watch a pitcher on TV or, you know, online, it's easier for me to see the pitch because obviously frame rate and all that. When I'm live, if I'm not behind home plate or behind the pitcher, it's hard for me to figure out what that pitch was. I, and maybe this is my bad eyesight, even though I don't wear glasses. But I mean, are you able to figure out like slider curve um, from the side angle or do you have to be behind home plate or, you know, more in the receiving area to kind of figure out what kind of pitch is just thrown? I think it depends. Like if I'm there to like actually look at the pitches and grade them, then I think mm. you need to be like right behind the plate where you could actually right. see the full movement. Okay. But one fun thing that like my cousin and I used to do at games was like, we'd be sitting, you know, in heaven or on the 200 level somewhere in some weird sure. view. And right. we would try to guess the pitches based on the pitch speed. And really? you could tell, like, if you really hone in on that, like, right. and you'd get some reps at it, you could start to tell, like, okay, like, that was a change up or for some of the curveballs, you could see the movement even from, like, other areas of the park. So I'm going to say, like, yes, I can kind of tell, but it's not, like, I never see a pitch and I'm like, oh, that was 100% a slider. You know, it could be a slider, it could be a curveball. You're just trying to judge based on, like, how it compares to the previous pitch in terms of velocity. Right. Um, but if the park has like something that tells you the pitch type, then you could check it after and then you get used to it. Right. 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 Yeah. That's great. Cause all right, then I'm not crazy. Cause I, <laughs> I was, I was, you know, you see some of these, uh, well, let, let's, uh, just talk about Clint Eastwood's movie where, you know, and Amy Adams, where he's like, he's able to just hear it. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, dude, no, uh, I wish I, I don't like, look at these pitches and like, that's a slider. I'm like, man, you are awesome. Cause I couldn't figure it. Now, again, of course, if, if it's an overhand delivery, you kind of could tell the way the hand kind of comes off right. the ball. But at the same time, you're like, what? And again, that's another reason why I think major league hitters are just phenomenal I, and why they fail so much, right? You know, any anytime you can go to somewhere and say, I fail, you know, 25% of the time and I'm an all-star, that's pretty phenomenal. Uh, so, yeah, I just, I think that's just great. All right. So going from harder to declining bad news stuff, who do you think's declined the most in 2023? Like who's just like, Oh my God, I can't believe like he just dropped off where I thought he was going to be pre, you know, preseason. I picked DJ LeMayu for this um, oh, because yeah. I am a big LeMayu fan. I still am. Um, I just think he was one of the best pure hitters in the game. Um and he was just so fun to watch all the time. And the first half of the season, I don't know if he was playing hurt. I don't know if the team was trying to like get him to stick to a certain game plan and it wasn't clicking with him because his approach like should be unique from any other hitter like on that team. Like he's not going to exclusively go for home run or whatever. He's, he's a contact hitter and that's how he should be approaching every at bat. But since the all-star break, his OPS is eight, 45, which is obviously a big improvement. It was 642 before the break. And he credited Sean Casey for that improvement. But I wonder if it was actually Sean Casey or if it was just like someone allowing him to have more leeway in terms of right. what actually happens when he steps up to the plate. Um, Cause like I said, he's a contact hitter. He shouldn't focus on pulling the ball all the time. Like one of his best best attributes is his ability to go to the opposite field. And that's when he is the most successful because he does have enough power to get a home run to both sides and and get these hard hit line drives. So I'm glad that he's doing better, but I was disappointed with him this season. Did you tell him that? Because I, 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 <laughs> I mean, I, I think I think it's important to let him know how disappointed you are. <laughs> Uh, that's awesome. Yeah, I, I saw the Sean Casey call out as well. And I remember Sean Casey, especially uh, late in his career, um, destroying the average on a lot of my teams. But yeah, I, I still was picking up the AGA LeMahieu because 
like you said, he's a professional hitter. And I just expected, even if he has kind of dips, he's going to figure it out. Right. And, uh, you know, I, I didn't even think about that point that somebody was kind of saying, look, we want you to be this hitter. We want you to do this, uh, this year. And he's just like, uh, have you seen how long I've been in the league? But that makes complete sense. And right. I'm, I mean, I'm, I don't uh, know if that's true, but no, it, sure. it might be if, if the team is saying like, oh, like, you know, this is the game plan. It's which is right. entirely possible. Like, I, I don't know. You never know with these kinds of things. So I, uh, I, I don't know if I pull, pulled this as one of the pre-show questions or not, but um, I definitely seen enough of your injury analysis to say that you could probably pull one of these out. No problem. But outside of Otani, because uh, everybody knows the Otani news is huge. Mm-hmm. what's the biggest injury from your perspective? And that could be, you know, just w- where he was, they were headed, you know, contract wise or where just impacted the team or just in general, what do you think the biggest injury news has been this season? There's been a lot. Um, the first person who popped into my head was um, Anthony Rizzo, maybe because we were just talking about the Yankees, but right. he was like the left-handed power bat that, that the Yankees needed for their short porch. And like it was very upsetting to see what he went through with his yep. concussion or whatever that ended up being that he was hurt for so long and he couldn't see the pitches that well. Right. I think that h- him not being present in the lineup every day at his full strength had a major impact just because like he has a very strong personality and presence as well. Right. So I'm sure that impacted that whole team in like multiple ways beyond just an out in the lineup. I did. Well, yeah, I, he was such a big pick for a lot of people, especially in best ball uh, this year. And it's funny to, well, it's not it's more sad where you see people that play fantasy have such a tendency to just forget people are human mm. and there's an actual human element to it. And when he, you know, he started, we started hearing more about what was actually going on versus just being a slump. And like you said, the concussion and then the, the eyesight, that was just scary. Uh, yeah, Cause absolutely. I, you know, it was just one of those things where it's like, okay, this, this somebody's that could, you know, their career could end right now or what's going on. So yeah, I'm, I'm glad you called that Anthony Rizzo. It's funny because you said that and I was thinking you were going to say, uh, you know, uh, Shane McClanahan. Oh, because you're just, <laughs> well, I just expect yeah. you to go raise. I expect you to go raise, but you, again, you constantly surprise me. I, I definitely expected to raise, but Rizzo is a great call out as well. So as I mentioned before, right. Um, this is a show that we like to tell people, um, how to do something like I, with Nick, you know, how to kind of spot injuries and which injuries are really the ones that you really need to kind of look out for, which injury wording. Do you have any tips for the fantasy players uh, out there that, well, let, let's ignore the ones that already know that they think they're scouts, <laughs> but the, the rest of us that know we're not scouts. What are some things that you could you know help us figure out or just give us tips on finding that next hitter or that next uh, person that might explode. You know, we see so many people pick, okay, this is a sleeper and they give us a lot of analytics and that's great. But is there any things that you are looking for that would might help us um, as we scout for the you know next season? Hmm. I'm going to caveat this by saying I haven't played fantasy in two years now. So I'm a little wrong <laughs> <laughs> because I, I wasn't allowed to play last year. So I wasn't sure what was going Absolutely. on. Absolutely. So I didn't play, but I would say in terms of just like what players are going to break out. I don't want to be too general, but if there was like a highly ranked prospect who like had a rough year, yeah. the year after maybe is like a good time to pick him up and, and give him another shot. Cause we see that a lot or, um, I know we, we talk about analytics sometimes, but anyone who is like underperforming in terms of like X slug or um, X woba, right. all that kind of stuff, they fly under the radar. Pitchers, if they have good control, that is like the number one thing that I used to look for control and like ability to get swing and miss. Right. Because from there, the team can change their pitch mix around. A lot of the time, we credit teams for changes when it's actually the player doing it himself. So like that too, like if a player is smart and you could tell, I think when you watch which players are smart based on like how they adjust their game plans mid game. Um, if you see like a smart player who has like stuff that moves a lot, but he it's just not clicking yet. Maybe that's someone to hang on to because when he figures it out, like that's going to be a very uh, difficult matchup for hitters. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, one of the things going to, you know, the prospect piece, you know, no, no LV uh, Marte, right. He, fell in so many 
rankings. I mean, he was top 10 easy in most rankings. And then he kind of had, I wouldn't say an off season, uh, but he was kind of a little bit all over the place, you know, injuries, and then also kind of figuring out things in Cincinnati as well when he got traded. And it just was odd to me because I looked at, A, the fact he's going to be playing in Cincinnati's ballpark, which is great hitters ballpark. And then two, like you said, he's got the prospect pedigree. Um, you, you know, watching what he was doing with Julio Rodriguez and, you know, them being still being best friends. Although I, I don't know if they're going to stay best friends oh, um, after, well, sorry, no, he got hit by somebody. Else. Somebody hit him in the face yesterday uh, before the game, which uh, I think it was Ellie De La Cruz. I'm sorry. I, Wait, said, what? Gonna... I had no idea. Yeah, I he got hit. In the, <laughs> yeah, they're, they're, they're playing catch. And I, I don't know if he was turned his head or something. And he uh, actually got pulled from the game in the first, like 15 minutes before. There was a delay for the game because he got hit in the face. Oh, my God. Uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, uh, but what I was going to say was that, like you said, right, um, everybody was kind of down on him. And I was like, well, there's not, I mean, yes, his home runs were down and, and this was down, but everything else seemed to be there. Uh, so I, I was picking him up as much as I can at a discount. And I think there's a lot of kind of group think there with the fantasy community, but I love, love the call out you said about control because the number one thing that will turn me off on a pitcher is, you know, seeing those walks per nine kind of shooting up. I, I don't care if you're hitting 14 Ks per nine somehow or something. If you have like six walks per nine, that just screams that you're going to cause me headaches in the future. Yes. Uh, so <laughs> when I see that piece, or if I just see them go to the race, right? It, that, or if you go to the race, then I, I, I definitely am I'm interested, but that that's a great call. Thank you so much. So, what is in the future here as the off season progresses? What can people expect from content on, on your site? And well, and, and also what you do for the athletic and everything else. What, what are the plans there? Well, I'm hoping to do some stuff for the playoffs um, coverage and, and talking about like game reviews, things that I noticed in terms of strategy and all that stuff. And then the off season will probably do like a lot of roster construction uh, talks, things like that, how certain teams could make improvements or even marginal improvements in certain areas, um, their biggest needs, their biggest strengths, like all that stuff heading into 2024. And then maybe some uh, reviews of some prospects that we saw this year, um, rule five stuff. I, I'm really putting a lot on my plate right now, but it could, <laughs> it could be <laughs> anything like that. Um, and I do take suggestions from my, my Patreon subscribers. So now that you're one of them, thank you, by the way. <laughs> you can suggest whatever you'd like. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm going to probably want a deep breakdown of Rule 5 because I think that's a, I think that along with the arbitration, I think is one of those things where people understand maybe from a high level, mm -hmm. but don't really understand the process itself. I, you know, uh, especially when like the Rule 5 draft, I think people understand, okay, well, you know, this person gets picked up and they have, they have to stay on the 40-man roster or else they get sent back. But there's, I think there's so much other gamemanship that goes on there, especially who deciding who gets, you know, protected and who's not being protected and why are they not protected? I think that there's a lot of, you know, key pieces there. I also love looking back on some of the rule five picks that you're just like, I can't believe they left them on, you know, unprotected. And you realize, well, that's the reason why, because he was, you know, he couldn't, I'm just throwing something crazy out there, but he couldn't hit the curveball or, you know, he was always hurt. And there's some stuff there that you're like, wow, if, uh, you know, looking back on it five years ago, the Rangers were really smart to do that. <laughs> so, you know, those are the types of things that I think is really interesting. Um, I would love to one time go to the um, the winter meetings. I think that would be one of the coolest things in the world to do, considering how many deals get done kind of in the hallway mm -hmm. um, of those things. I, I think that just would be mind blowing just to be kind of a fly on the wall during some of those discussions that occur. So. I would Definitely. love to do that. I would love to do that too. Uh, maybe we'll this get year it done. Maybe. Yeah. Go, go, you need to go to the winter meetings. I think, yeah. you know, that's going to be my number one suggestion. Send you to the winter meetings and then you should start a GoFundMe so we can just get you the passes right. and everything you need. We'll see. Well, well Andrea, well, I would love to revisit this talk maybe right before next season. Um, you know, again, thank you so much for joining us. This was awesome. I learned a lot. I hope everybody getting to watch learned a lot. And if you have any questions for Andrea, please. Drop us a message. I'll make sure she gets it. Um, this is was absolutely, you know, fantastic. Thank you so much for your time today. Yeah, thanks so much for having me on again. I had a lot of fun. Oh, definitely. Well, I look forward to having you again. And uh, thank you so much for watching this. This is brought to you by FantasySixPack.net. Thank you.